Hello everyone. This is Anand Kulkarni from Tata Motors. Today I'm going to talk about an exciting and interesting topic of energy management in electric vehicles or EVs as we call them. Battery EVs always carry a finite amount of energy on board. And even today, recharging takes significantly longer than what it would take to refuel an ICE engine vehicle. And range is perhaps the most critical aspect that defines the usability of an EV. Energy management is therefore a cost-effective answer for range improvement. A lot of time, effort, sweat and toil is spent in attempts of maximizing vehicle range and broadly speaking, I would categorize them into the following three approaches. The first one is we could easily increase battery capacity on board and which is a very instinctive option. But then beyond a certain point, packaging, weight and cost will definitely become an issue. The second one could be improving energy efficiency in order to maximize the range within the given battery capacity. And the third one could be a hybrid or a blended approach of both the above approaches of either increasing battery size or increasing the energy efficiency. Energy efficiency is actually optimizing the energy consumption within a vehicle without affecting performance, drivability, or comfort, which can be achieved in the following few ways. One is through vehicle improvements, such as aerodynamics, rolling losses, overall weight management, reduction of friction uh, in drive lines, and regenerative strategies that we use. The second one could be in terms of optimizing thermal management using appropriate and effective cooling in electric parts like the e-drive, power unit, and the battery. And lastly, an area which is seldom overlooked, which is about ancillary load reductions and drive cycle or duty cycle optimizations. All of these, or a combination of all these put together, will result into an improvement in range per charge and the desired range can be achieved through optimized battery giving us a phenomenal cost advantage. Now all of these measures as I said are used in combination by development engineers to deliver outstanding performance as well as range on our vehicles. Now before we go deeper into EV energy management let's take a moment to understand that Energy management between an ICE vehicle and an EV vehicle is different. Primarily because in an EV, the majority of engine losses that happen on an IC vehicle are absent. The most efficient combustion engines today have an efficiency of less than 37%. That means they can convert only about 37% of the fuel energy into energy that is used for traction and to power onboard devices. The rest of it is lost through either exhaust, surface radiation, or overcoming friction in moving parts. The EV motors, on the contrary, have a very high degree of efficiency, and therefore, intrinsically, they are able to convert a large part of the available energy into traction. As a result, it is possible to visualize the key differences as seen in the figure on your screen. The proportion of the energy consumed through major aggregates changes significantly between an ICE and an EV. In the case of an EV, the vehicle losses such as rolling losses or aerodynamic losses or the amount of energy that is spent in thermal management and the ancillaries, as you can see, gains a lot more importance as compared to an ICE vehicle. Now we know that the body style always plays a very key role in vehicle aerodynamics and this is true whether it's an IC vehicle or an EV vehicle. But especially in the EVs, it becomes super important to choose the right body style, balancing between packaging, dynamics, the aerodynamics, and the cost. It is typical to see roughly a seven to eight percent improvement in range for every 10 percent improvement in aero drag on highways. Therefore, a few key areas that we will have to work on for improvement of aerodynamics are in terms of the exterior design, the underbody, the underhood and the wheel aerodynamics. This also, of course, comes with 
challenges in terms of styling compromises and conflict between vehicle attributes, engineering challenges, cost, timeline, and so and so forth. Rolling losses are typically on account of the tires and the vehicle weight itself. Now, rolling loss reduction is an area that the industry has been very keenly focusing on. Because typically, a 10% improvement in rolling losses leads to an improvement of 2% range in the city and a 3% range improvement on the highways. Rolling losses are typically quantified by a parameter called CRR, coefficient of rolling resistance, and it is measured in Newton per ton of the vehicle weight. Now in the last half a decade, roughly half a decade, the CRRs have improved from a value of around eight and a half to about seven today, and the industry is already focusing on how to go sub six, sub six Newton per ton. You'll realize that this is a journey of roughly around 40% improvement, and as you can easily compute, it's going to bring a 12 to 13% improvement in fuel efficiency or range, as we would call on electric vehicles. Of course, the changes in rolling resistance that are being brought on because of the compound that is used for construction can have an effect on other attributes of the tire, including ride and handling, durability, life, etc. So as development engineers, we have to work on these balances and achieve the right one that is required. Small improvements, can also be achieved in terms of low drag calipers, which is a part of the braking system, the wheel bearings, and also with the right kind of transmission geometry, the ratios become important, as well as low viscosity oil that we use in the transmission. Now on this slide, you are able to see that there is a potential to gain roughly between three and a half to 5% efficiency only through thermal optimization. And let's talk about what thermal optimization is. It can basically be divided into two key parts for an electric vehicle. The first one is of course the cabin comfort, which is the occupant comfort. And the second one is battery cooling. Now in terms of cabin comfort, not only the right sizing of the compressor, but also the control strategies play a very, very important role. The control is in order to meet the cabin temperature based on demands of solar load, humidity, or outside ambient temperature, and therefore we need to deploy these. It also needs to be ensured that there is a minimum amount of mixing for hot and cold air because heat is a free energy in case of ice. But in case of the battery electric vehicle, you need to create heat, therefore requiring more energy. So it should also not feel overcooled or stuffy. So the right selection has to be made. The second part is the battery thermal management itself. And I would say that the batteries in an electric vehicle work the best when they are not too cold and not too hot as well. This is what I call the Goldilocks zone. Too hot, they don't like it. Too cold, they don't like that as well. Therefore, we need to make the right choice of the battery chiller and decide on the correct temperature set points for the system not to be too warm or too cold. Now, this obviously puts a requirement in terms of the appropriate pump duty, the cycle itself, the right distribution of cooling loads between the battery and the cabin, and all of this becomes a very important part for development engineers to work on. Another key difference between an ICE and a battery electric vehicle is the battery electric vehicle's ability to regenerate energy. Now, regeneration means recovery of the vehicle's kinetic energy as the vehicle is decelerating. The motor acts as a generator while decelerating, and a considerable amount of kinetic energy is recovered. Whereas in an ICE vehicle, in a traditional ICE vehicle, the entire kinetic energy is lost through brakes, unless, of course, it is equipped with a hybrid system and some amount of it can be regained. But there are two possible strategies that one can deploy in a battery electric vehicle. The first one is a series braking, and the second one is a parallel braking. Now in series braking, majority of the braking happens only through the motor. Now only when the motor is unable to meet the braking demands, the foundation brakes will come into picture. This is the most efficient method to regenerate on an EV, and electric vehicles, as we know, lend themselves to what is called as single pedal drive because of this possibility. However, it 
definitely poses a very high challenge in control strategies and particularly in markets which are adopting to new technology. These strategies therefore need to be fine-tuned based on the market expectations as well as the consumer demands. The second one as I said was parallel braking where both the foundation brake as well as the regeneration act in tandem at all times and the right braking performance is achieved through the correct blending between the two. Here the challenges are in terms of the right level of blending so that the braking is consistent, predictable, comfortable and of course safe. Let's now quickly look at another very small but equally an important and a valuable contributor of ancillary load reduction. The various pumps, lamps, fans and electronic control units, the ECUs, are major ancillary consumers of energy. They amongst themselves possess an ability to improve the efficiency by about a percent, which gets translated into 1% range improvement as well. And in this case, the right component selection and the right control strategy is extremely important. The control strategies need to ensure the most efficient operation within the boundaries of engineering requirements and component protection. One of the biggest challenges is to manage all these levers and fit them and deliver them within the product development cycle. As you can therefore see, energy efficiency needs a very detailed analysis at all levels, component, subsystem, and at the vehicle level. Around 60 to 70% of the work done is in the virtual domain by component and vehicle simulations to minimize the time required. The rest of it is done through very accurate physical measurements before the final assessment and certification. I would think that the final optimization with the help of actual feel on the road cannot substitute anything else because finally it is the proof of the pudding as we would call it. As a matter of recap now, let's look at what we have discussed today. Broadly speaking, five areas to work on from a hardware plus control side, those areas being the vehicle itself, the high voltage systems, thermal management of the battery, climate comfort, and of course the low voltage systems. I've tried to summarize the specific points in each of these broad areas that would need to be worked on to achieve the goal of energy efficiency in an electric vehicle. It's important to understand here that there are also cross dependencies amongst each of these areas that a development engineer has to factor in during his work on the vehicle. And finally, I would like to summarize the key takeaways for today's session as below. Energy efficiency is the amount of energy consumed at power source per kilometer of driving range, which includes both driving as well as charging efficiency. Why do we need to do it? Because high voltage battery capacity is limited and all systems including driving is supported through this. Additionally, the charging time is also higher than gas filling in an IC. So usability within acceptable acquisition cost depends heavily on energy efficiency. And how do we do it? Take like the right components with the right efficiency. We balance the cost, size and efficiency, which is the most critical part. We select the right control system and optimize it for the best efficiency. There has to be a handshake of virtual and physical assessment to achieve this best efficiency that we have talked about. And finally, I would say, not even a single watt hour of energy should go missing while optimization is being done. Finally, all of this has to be accounted for. Every watt hour of energy is important. I hope this session helps you in your own journey or journeys in improving energy efficiency on the projects that you're working on. Thank you and all the best.